what the hell are you doing? <laughs> All right, Dogs here are... we go. That's cool. yeah, I got All right, let people join on here in a few, give a couple minutes for people to join on. Cool. And as people are joining on, uh, you should have the, uh, the chat or Q&A function because we're going to be taking your questions and comments uh, during the show. We'll give it a minute here to let people join. Anyone has a shout out or a question, they can shoot it through the chat Q&A function just to make sure that we know that you're there. We've got over a hundred tickets sold. So hopefully we got a good, all right, Tammy Colson's in. Thanks Tammy for, uh, for joining and letting us know that you're there. Hopefully you're bidding your salary away. <laughs> All right, we'll get started. So we are at our seven o'clock program for the evening and uh, that would be Eastern Standard Time, unlike midnight in London where we've got Wordsmith here. Uh, we're really excited to have Wordsmith uh, as our uh, visiting artist for our show tonight, Heart to Art. Uh, Wordsmith is a published author, screenwriter, former advertising copywriter and emerging street artist. artist. Born and raised in Cleveland, he relocated to LA and started doing time in Hollywood, chasing the dream like countless others. Past and present worlds merged when he came up with a concept for, Mer for Wordsmith, a unique combination of stenciling and wheat pasting and began painting and pasting walls in Los Angeles with indelible thoughts and phrases. Active in the street art community since November of 2013, he's made his mark in Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, San Diego, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, New Orleans, Philadelphia, Memphis, West Palm Beach, Miami, Toronto, London, Paris, Berlin, Krakow, Edinburgh, Melbourne, Tokyo, Auckland, New Zealand, and wait, wait for it, soon to be Cleveland, Ohio. Woo! All right. So All let's jump into the conversation and uh, we'll just let the conversation flow. We got a few things we wanna talk about, but we always want some, uh, uh, questions from the audience here. Um, for audience members, please remember to use the chat and Q&A function so that we can get your questions. We'll try to get as many of them in tonight as possible. But for now, uh, cheers. Cheers to you. Cheers. It's Work fantastic to, uh, to be here. I'm yeah. so happy to be talking to Cleveland and, and coming to Cleveland in the future and just, just having a relationship. Like, like you said, I, I was born and raised there, so it means a lot to me. Well, we're excited to hear about your story and your ties to Cleveland, and uh, we're really honored to have you uh, spend your time with us. And then also, thank you for some of your uh, your gifts and donations, Brody, that uh, we have here on the auction tonight. So we have several of your pieces of your uh, art can, and we also really appreciate the the mural that you're going to bring uh, to one of the bidders that's lucky enough to uh, to get that tonight. So we'll talk a little bit about when they might be able to get that installation in their home and office. Good. Yeah, so great. So uh, we have Wordsmith. Welcome to the Graffiti Heart fundraiser, everybody, and uh, to the art program. And uh, joining us live from London is Wordsmith. I'm going to refer to to Wordsmith as Brody. He, uh, since we're friends, we've uh, had I've had the pleasure to get to know Brody a little bit more over the past few months and weeks. Um, and so uh, let's just jump into it. So let's, let's talk first about Wordsmith the Artist. Um, you know, for those that are on, uh, that are on this, uh, this live stream, you know, many know of you, many are, are recently knowing of you, but tell us about the artist Wordsmith. Tell us about your, your, your canvas and, and your genre and your medium, so. Okay. Um, well, I am a word-based artist, and the reason that's important is I am a writer, first and foremost. Um, I've always been a writer. I think it took some time to realize that, but, but I just love the written word. And the secret to me as a writer is I love writing in a lot of different mediums. You kind of went through that list. I've written short stories. I am a published author. I worked in advertising. Um, I did a blog when you know blogs were 
hitting and and just really liked expressing myself in all these different mediums. I've written screenplays, I've written for TV, reality TV, um, and now street art, which we'll get to, is just another medium. It's actually a kick-ass one, you know what I mean, that I get to write in and express myself in. Um, so when I did kind of get the crazy notion of doing street art, I knew it would be word-based. I came up with the image of a typewriter with a page coming out of it. And I got so excited about that idea because to me it was so simple that I had to Google if anybody had done it before. And the moment I realized nobody had, uh, I did the research, I just knew I needed to make it, make it a reality. So my mediums, I spray paint, I work with stencils, the typewriter that you see um, that's been painted in all those cities all across you know, the world um, is always painted. And then the page is either a wheat pasted page or now as I you know, evolve and get bigger and, and go to places that I want the pieces to last, I, I paint the page also. Um, and going back to what I said about painting and wheat pasting, the cool thing that got me really excited about the idea, because um, I loved street art, was that it incorporates those two basic elements, stenciling and wheat pasting, and it combined them together. And I, I really kind of saw nobody doing that in that kind of simple of an idea. Again, typewriter with a page coming out of it. So that's what just kind of was the springboard for me to dive into, I, I say a dive into a pool of unknown, which I think is the healthiest thing to do as a person. So are you doing that full time now, Brody? I am. Um, that's part of my story. Um, when I started it, I got to be honest, I, I was doing it for me. I needed an active hobby. I was spending so much time in front of the computer writing, doing what I love, but so much time that I realized I need something that got me out and about in a way. But I knew me like if I did, I always say like if I took up photography, three months down the road, I would resent photography because it was taking me away from writing. So there was this little conundrum looking for an active hobby. I married that with my love for street art and came up with that idea. Um, again, this is why I'm saying it. When I started, I was doing it for me. Um, I was having fun. It was invigorating. It was doing exactly what I needed for an active hobby, but I never expected to make a dime. I think anybody that puts paint on a wall or wheat paste is hoping to get noticed or get some reaction from people, but I never expected the snowball effect that ultimately happened and the ride that I've been on for like the last nine years. But to answer your question, yes, I do it full time, which, which given the beginning, the impetus of that story is just amazing. Like I still at times go, holy shit, I can't believe nine years later, here I am. And I started doing it full time, like maybe four or five years you know, in um, maybe even less. And I was lucky, you know what I mean? That I was, but I, but I was also having so much fun and was so passionate about it that I dove into another pool of unknown and just said, I'm going to do this whole time and, and just see where, where, where the ceiling is. So there is one. It, it is. So, so what's your hobby now? Now that that was your hobby, do you have a hobby now? Are you still writing and are you still doing your, your initial passion? Absolutely. Um, the great thing about like wordsmith and this ride that I've been on is I meet all these people and even um, just in all walks of life, including the people that I was chasing when I moved to Los Angeles. And we'll get to that part of the story, but I was writing screenplays and, and, you know, wanting to write for TV and I wrote a novel and now those works are getting some notice. You know what I mean? I'm talking to people about my book and, and, you know, getting it, um, into some other medium, you know what I mean? Whether it's a movie or a Netflix um, kind of, um, what am I trying to say? Like a, like a, like a limited event series. Um, and that's been fun. So yes, I continue to um, flex the creative muscle in, in those different mediums. The, the most amazing thing that I'm gonna say right now is I don't have a lot of time for the long form writing and that is an incredible problem to have. I hope I find the balance at some point because I even have my second book in me. I know what I want it to be, but I'm having fun wordsmithing. So, so there's, I'm trying to find that balance and I need to invent the 48 hour day is what I need to do. Isn't that for sure. Even, even with uh, the pandemic and you think, you know, yeah. early on we were all kind of down, but it feels like things have just snowballed with uh with new creative opportunities for artists is that Absolutely. have you seen that happen with you 
Uh, absolutely. I think when, when, when the lockdown and the pandemic first hit, I, I didn't know how much art I would be doing. Um, and it was surprising. Like I, the first piece I did while I was in lockdown was expressing, I think what we were all going through and I, I printed it up and put it on a typewriter that I had in my house, you know what I mean? And took a picture of it and I put that on, on, on my feed and the outpouring was incredible. And that led me to, I guess, not one to profit for it. So I made it into a downloadable print that you could print in your home and, and put it on your wall and the outpouring of that was incredible. And then people kept saying, oh my God, we want this as a print. We want this as a commission. So, so it kind of, I was like, oh wow, maybe you can you know, do art during a pandemic. So I, I, I started doing what I do, you know what I mean? And creating you know, prints and, and pieces and, and going out in the city and putting words words up safely you know what i mean it, the great thing about the lockdown is there was nobody out and about so as a street artist you had the streets to yourselves so so to answer your question yeah i was pleasantly surprised that that words were and, and it's I, I say pleasantly surprised that i that i that i was able to do art but i was not surprised in hindsight that the words were so embraced i mean people in this time are just looking for inspiration and and that's me that's one thing we didn't talk about um, yet of, of my, what I do is I'm a very positive person. So the words I put on walls are very positive, very uplifting, motivational, romantic. So people really, really need that now. And, and, and it's been fun to kind of explore that, explore just what's going on in the world. I love it. It is. It's so inspirational and positive and uh, it just draws you in. It, I just look forward to seeing what your next you know, your, your next piece is going to be in, you know, with yeah. next, uh, you know, your next phrase and such. But let's talk about kind of where this all started, Brody. So you're from Cleveland. The Cleveland yes. area. Yeah, right? we didn't talk about that. Yeah, I was born and raised in Cleveland. And um, I grew up in, I'm a writer, so I'm going to tell you the story yeah, that I've written in my mind over the years. Um, and I, and I, I tell it, I tell it in a funny way, I think. I, I, I always say I grew up in the 157. Um, making it sound, you know, pretty tough uh, in this in this world, you know, street art world or whatever. Um, and what I mean by that is, I, I I grew up in Cleveland on West 157th Street, which was literally one street from the wrong side of the tracks. Like across the street, the rapid ran, and I used to joke like that's the wrong side of the tracks, and we hope we live one street on the right side. Um, and then I make a joke that like somehow I got out alive, you know what I mean? Again, like bringing this, 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 uh, this, this feeling of, of whatever, you know what I mean? It was, it was the 157. Um, and then when I was in high school, we moved to, I think right when I started high school, we moved to Fairview Park and that's when everything went to hell. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I grew up there in Fairview Park. I caddied at Westwood Country Club. I went to St. Ignatius. Um, and you loved it there, right? Your name. I did not. <laughs> I did not. It, it, it was a great. It was a great foundation. Like I learned a lot, and it was great teachers and blessed St. Ignatius hearts. But I hated it while I was there. It was just. It was just a stupid time. I mean, I guess it's always a stupid time when you're growing up. Yeah. But like, I, like I was made fun of for liking Depeche Mode, and now Depeche Mode's <laughs> being inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'm like, fuck all of you. Like I was ahead of my time. You know what I mean? And, so it's just things like that, but but yeah. When I um, this is leading into the next part of the story. When I well, I let me back up a little bit because when I was growing up, I was um, I'm the youngest of three, and I had very very strict parents. Um, and being the youngest of three, I tried to get away with everything. I got away with a lot because I learned from my older brother and sister. But I got caught a lot, so I got grounded a lot. And the reason I'm bringing that up is that's what kind of created. I know now that what created the dreamer in me because okay. I was a reader, I was a comic book kid. So when I was grounded, all I did was crawl up in my own head and start writing my own stories. So bless my parents' heart, as strict <laughs> as they were, they created this person, this creative person, um, and I love them Advice for that. Advice to parents, right? What's that? Advice to parents. Exactly. Yeah. Um, even when you're doing it wrong, you're somehow doing it right, but yeah. that's parenting. Um, and then what I was going to say is um, after, oh, I went to Miami University and uh, when I went to my university because of strict parents getting grounded, going to St. Ignatius, which was an all boys high school for 
anybody that doesn't know that. When I got to college at Miami, I felt like I was paroled. I was literally just a kid in a candy store of, of freedom and girls and just everything. And it was just awesome. Yeah. So, and I had a lot of fun in college. Like I had the best college experience. There's, there's college friends of mine that I saw sign on uh, earlier. So hello, uh, private Idaho. Hello, Miami University. Um, and I had a really, really great uh, college experience. Um, and then after college, I'm rambling, but after college, I moved to Chicago and that led to, um, the, the work in advertising that you previously mentioned. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. And so what got you out of Cleveland? I mean, you it was just the fact that I was, was born and raised, you know what I mean? And I think like everything that I just kind of said, strict parents yeah. and, and just kind of like when I graduated, I knew I wanted out, like everybody wants to kind of spread their wings. And I thought about New York, um, but Chicago just, just was so, I don't know, more accessible and friendly. And, and, and I just loved it. I was, um, you asked about hobbies. I'm a big sports fan. So I'm a big Browns fan and, and huge Indians fan, but I was also a Cubs fan because of WGN, like I used to come home and they were from school and they were, the baseball games were on. So, um, so I, I knew about Chicago and it was kind of like, I guess, built up in my mind. My brother lived there also for a period of time. Okay. So I had been there and I just, I was kind of like, that would be a cool city to move to. Again, loved Cleveland, but it was just kind of like, I wanted to be on my own. I wanted to spread my wings and, and, um, and I fell into advertising as a career, which was good. I was good at it. And, um, and I was kind of a long, I was in it for a couple of years and I was um, getting promoted and making tons of money, but I ultimately knew kind of quickly, even though it was, a, it was a bunch of years that I just wasn't happy. I wasn't doing the creative kind of work that I wanted to be doing. Um, so on that cliche, I, I quit my job and told everybody I was going to move to Los Angeles to, to, you know, write, to write screenplays and, and TV and, and uh, things of that nature. Um, and there is a funny story about that because everybody has their moment that they knew they were done with the corporate world or, yeah. or you could have those moments. Um, and mine came like, like, again, I, I, I was, I was good at what I was doing. I was getting promoted, but I knew I wasn't happy. There was that seed of like, I just, I just don't think this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. But the moment I knew I was, I was done, um, was I was in a meeting and the subject of the meeting was how to have more efficient meetings. <laughs> and the two people that called the meeting were integral to the meeting and the meeting that couldn't start without them, they were 15 minutes late. <laughs> so I will never forget that 15 minutes, I was just sitting in this conference room going, that was it. I can't, I can't do this anymore. And I just was like, I just knew I was, I was like formulating a plan an escape plan. Um, um, and it was just, it was just a moment for me that I'll never forget. Like, I'm so thankful for those two bosses for being late because it just made me say I'm great done with story. the corporate world. Yeah. That's a great story. It's like, it, it's kind of like that video they have out, you know, where people are like coming into a conference room. It's just kind of like, when do you get the work done? You know, it's exactly. Total Dilbert. So you were one of the lucky ones who went from corporate office to the streets. Right? I was. Yeah. I mean, when yeah. you went to LA, I mean, I'd imagine that wasn't. Because you were still, you were leaving an advertising career. You, you didn't just jump right into street art, did you? I did not. Um, again, I went and that's when I really started to explore the different mediums that I could write in. Um, and LA was really good to me from the get-go. I mean, it was frustrating. Um, I, was, I was broke a lot of the time, but I always say this, like, like when, I so, when I told my family and friends that I was gonna move to, you know, quit my job and move to LA, everybody thought I was crazy. Like there was this like, my, I remember my family so worried about me and I couldn't explain to them, they get it now, but I'm like, even when I was driving, you know, uh, west and I always say I was driving in the left direction but I knew it was the right direction um, and when I got to LA and was poor and just struggling I was so much happier than when I was working in advertising and getting promoted and making a lot of money um, and and they just couldn't understand that but then little successes that happened in LA like I wrote a short script that ended up winning a contest and the winning the the prize in the contest was I got to make my film when that happened, 
there was a little bit of affirmation. And even my parents who were just like, you're out of your mind. What are you doing? You're ruining your life. Be like your sister and brother. They were kind of like, hey, that's our son. You know what I mean? And it was like, it was kind of cool. Um, it was a cool moment, but I continued to have those moments. You know what I mean? Like working in and screenplays and working in reality TV. Um, and then, and then part of my story is I was working in reality TV and a show would end and I'd have this nest egg of money and time. And that's when I pulled myself away and would write. And I wrote this a manuscript that ended up turning into a novel that ended up getting published and that was that was huge for me so to answer your question no street art didn't come until much later I always loved street art especially when I got to Los Angeles I was blown away by it just was everywhere in the city and and some of my heroes you can see them behind me I was just always inspired by and thought it was such a cool medium this is a major part of my story I was in awe of it, but I didn't think I could do it. Like I thought superheroes did it. I, I was just amazed that these pieces appear overnight on, on walls and buildings and rooftops. And I was just like, that's the coolest thing in the world. And it wasn't until that part of the story that I, that I mentioned earlier, where I knew I needed an active hobby. I, it was a conundrum because I knew it needed to be something that was word-based and I loved street art. It wasn't until I thought, typewriter plus page and googled and found out that nobody had done it before that I got so excited about that idea I forgot all about my fear I just was like I need to pee all over this idea I need to mark my territory and from the moment of thinking painted typewriter to wheat pasted page I think it was like maybe a week and a half maybe 10 days before I was packing a backpack and going out to do my first piece in between there was who I am, I was like, how do you make stencils? I started Googling, you know, tutorials, what is wheat paste and just started figuring it out on my own. Um, and, and, and now we're getting to that, that point of every artist story, that first night you go out and those first pieces you do was just a holy, holy wow um, experience for me. Um, first of all, everybody will tell you when you go out that first night, you're scared shitless, even though you're excited to what you're doing and you're, yeah. you're putting your art up, you hear a helicopter in Los Angeles and you think they're coming after you. So it was a hilarious night of like fear and adrenaline and holy shit, look what I did. But I also say this about that night. I felt like I got bit by a radioactive can of spray paint <laughs> because I realized, holy shit, I have this in me. I want to do this. And, and again, part of that story that I said that I never expected to make a dime, that, that I was just doing it for me. I didn't care if people saw it. I just wanted to keep doing it. And those first couple of weeks and months were just me on adrenaline. You know what I mean? Just, yeah. just saying, I want to put more pieces up and I want to, I want to just, I want to write this and I want to say this and I want to figure out how to get it a little bigger. And, and just like every street, every street artist does or every artist does. Um, and that's when, um, because I did, this was right when Instagram was blowing up. I was taking a picture of everything in my mind. It was, I just wanted to have a library of, of, right. of every Document. documented piece, but I was doing the hashtag wordsmith and hashtag wordsmith in LA. And that's when I kind of saw that other people were taking photos and finding me on Instagram and hashtagging and this snowball effect started that I was like oh wow people the people are in Los Angeles which is hard to get anybody to, to look at you or interact with you or, or whatever it was uh, it was kind of cool that I was like these people are seeking out my pieces and and that was the beginning of the like I said snowball effect or butterfly effect so you probably find yourself not being able to sleep just thinking about your next for for a long time yeah and that's part of my story too for a long time i was um i was still working i was writing on stuff and and working on you know like i said uh tv shows and reality tv and all this different stuff but i was also so fueled by getting up my next piece and and what i would do is i'm an early riser um, unlike most writers that, that write at night, I realized you're going to hit a wall when you do that. So years ago, I started waking up early and you have the whole day in front of you. 
So I started waking up two hours earlier and I would get up at like at four o'clock and go out and put up pieces and then come back all jazz and just write all day. Um, but, but that was it. Like, I, I don't know when I slept those first couple of weeks and months because I would go to sleep, like with all, with everything packed up and ready to go. And, and like a kid on Christmas Eve going, I can't wait to wake up. So somehow I, I did get enough sleep to, to function throughout the day, but it was, it was pretty cool. And then the reason I say that's a major part of my story is it wasn't long before I realized, I think somebody gave me a wall. It was like one of the first walls somebody gave me in Hollywood. It was like a comedy club. And I went to do this piece and I was doing it, taking my time and everything. And then when I was packing up, I was like, I'm on Hollywood Boulevard in the middle of the day. Huh? Nobody stopped me. Nobody asked any questions. I'm sure cops passed me. So this light bulb went, light bulb went off in my head and I'm like, hide in plain sight like why am I getting up at four o'clock in the morning where anybody that passes you is like what the hell is that person doing so I started doing all my pieces in the middle of the day acting like I was supposed to be there and and that was a that was a game changer for me because I was able to function as a normal person but still you know, do pieces at all these odd times. Like I'd be going to meet somebody for dinner and I'd be like, oh, I want to hit that wall. And I would hit the wall and then come with paint on my hands and be like, you know, so it was just, it was a major thing um, of, of just saying kind of like, why, why are we doing this in the middle of the night? And, and it worked for me, you know what I mean? I've been very yeah. lucky um, with, with, with not getting caught, not getting arrested. I, I have had cops. Did you ever get, yeah. Did anyone ever approach yeah. you, a police officer or some, a building owner or anything like that? With yes. Um, I, I've had, I've had all the above, like, like uh, the first time cops ever rolled up on me, it was about, it was over, it was like a year and a half almost. And I remember I was doing a piece. It was early in the morning and I, I looked to my, I just kind of felt something and I looked and the, the cop car was slow rolling up to me and I'm like, oh, this is it. You know what I mean? I'm not gonna run. Um, and, and, and I was like, oh shit, this is it. I'm gonna get arrested. And the cops got out and they talked to me for about 60 seconds. And I was so nervous because it was a year and a half in and I'm like, this is it, take me away. And the, the, I will never forget that 60 seconds in, one of the cops goes, hey, hey, don't be nervous. We actually like what you're doing. <laughs> and that was a whole game changer. They still ran everywhere. my name. What's that? We need those cops everywhere. That's awesome. We do. That's they awesome. still ran my name and, and checked if I had any priors or a record, and I didn't. And they just kind of let me off with a, hey, just be smart and do whatever. Uh, or just just be smart and 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 you know another cop might not you know have this kind of attitude and I got that and that's also part of my story because I said I'll never run and that's true like if I'm doing a piece right. I'm, and the cop rolls up on me I'm gonna let him do his job and if he needs to arrest me or give me a ticket or do whatever that's fine because I feel like I'm doing my job my art I think because of the outpouring and the butterfly effect, um, I, I know it's, I know it's um, affecting people, it's resonating with people, it's helping them. And, and I think my art beautifies rather than destroys. And I always try to do that. I'll tell a story about utility boxes that demonstrates that. But, but I really, I started to believe in what I was doing so, so I, I wouldn't run and I would just talk to them and say, I'm trying to inspire and I'm trying to beautify. If they, again, if they need to do that, their job, that's fine, but it's not gonna deter me from doing mine. And, and that was important. I think that's an important lesson for, for artists or especially street artists to learn is just believe in what you're doing and anybody of authority is gonna respect that. Uh, the other part of the question that you, and, that you asked was, I do, I do get noticed by people, like like yeah. people will, when I'm doing a piece, will stop and roll up or, or stop their cars. I've had, I've had people jump out of cars because they're like, oh my God, you're wordsmith. And I love that. Like I'll always stop to talk to anybody. Um, and I learned that from the best, like Shepard Ferry behind me, that guy is just my hero and he will take the time and talk to anybody. And I always love that. Um, and, and you have to, you know what I mean? Because we're inspiring people. We're trying to do exactly that. So I'd be a hypocrite if I'd be like, I don't have time for you or, or, and that's why I pay it forward a lot. Like I love doing work at schools. 
um, and, and just kind of trying to inspire all, all age groups and telling them just to dream bigger. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling, but I'm going to go off on a tangent before yeah. we bring it back. Like the first time I was ever doing work in a school, I was like, I was asked to do work in a school. I'm like, wait, I'm a role model. How the hell am I a role model? And, the, and, and then the kids like came and saw me and had all these questions. And I realized, holy shit, I am. And then I walked away. And when I was posting pictures of the experience and the yeah. work I did at the school, I was like, if a, if a street artist came to my school, not saying Ignatius, like, like some, like they came to my school when I was a kid, my mind would have been blown. I probably right. would have became a street artist like 20 years earlier because I would have been so fucking inspired by it. But, but, um, but I did realize, yeah, in, in even this walk of life, you can inspire people. That's awesome. So, I mean, speaking of high school, before you get into the rest of your story, we've got a question from uh, one of the uh, attendees. They want to know what advice would you give to a high school student who's talented in art and needs to try different mediums? What's your general advice? Um, my general advice for, I, I wrote it as a word um, and I'm just going to recite it because I believe in it. It's the reason I wrote it. And it's not only for artists, it's for anybody in any walk of life, especially creative. And it's um, do it for yourself. Um, oh, I'm going to forget it. Um, do it for yourself, do what you love, and then hope what you do resonates with others. And if you really dissect that, you have to, first of all, do it for you. Like I said, when I started, and I'm not, I'm not like the poster child for it, but this is just my story. I was doing it for me. I needed that activity and I found something that I enjoyed that I loved. And that was expressing, putting words on a wall, hoping people would see it. And then the fact that it resonated was massive for me because of those first two things. Um, and I would even say that, like I talk to actors and it's like, you don't wanna be the next so-and-so or singers. Like you don't wanna be the next Taylor Swift. You don't wanna be the next Rihanna. You have to find your own voice. You know what I mean? First of all, and and then make it has to make you happy. Um, I even say that to like writers and screenwriters, like if you're not enjoying the process of writing, get out because you have to enjoy that because that has to make you happy and satisfy you because the success or making money at it might not come or might not come for a while. So if you're just chasing that and trying to like write whatever is whatever you think is going to sell, you're you're not doing it right. So that's the advice I would give is just find what what you really love to do and what and just hope it resonates with others. Great. Right. Thanks. Thanks. And when it does, it's 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 huge. And, and that can resonate with anything you do, right? Uh, if, Absolutely. Even if you're in advertising in corporate America or in HR, like myself. Absolutely. Right? And I think that's a good lesson for advertising right. and, and the corporate world. It's it's too often or not, they overthink. And that was one of the reasons I wanted out. I kept thinking great ideas got watered down. And it was like, what are we doing? Like, this was our idea. And then there's too many chefs in the kitchen. So that, again, another tangent. Cool. No, that's great. So speaking of medium... Uh, you not only do walls or you not, not only have done walls, you know, but you talked about utility boxes. I mean, was that part of your early experimentation? Was that illegal? Was. was that commission? Like, what was that for you? It's a cool story because, um, utility boxes, I think in a lot of cities, but especially Los Angeles, they're everywhere. They're on every street corner and street artists, I didn't invent this, street artists love hitting them because of that stop traffic. You can put something on a, on a box and on a busy intersection and you know it's gonna get seen. And even on the other side of the box, walking traffic, it's gonna get seen. But I looked at the utility box, this ugly gray thing that you'd put a piece of street art and somebody would come and slap gray paint over it. And that was their job to, we call it buffing, to buff it back to the ugly gray. And it was so frustrating. So I looked at the utility box and said, I'm gonna paint all four sides some color and then put my art on it. Again, during the day, I was like, I'm gonna look like I'm supposed to be there. And the art asked, lasted longer. Like I was really surprised that I think somebody came and said, oh, that's supposed to be there. And then over the course of time, again, I don't think it was because of me, but, but over the course of my, my, my time, like maybe three years into 
wordsmithing, the city started giving artists boxes and you'd get this paperwork and, and this was your box and you could, you could do what you want with it. And, and a lot of artists started painting all four sides and making it look beautiful instead of this ugly gray thing. So I just kind of like, I, I, again, looked at the, and that's what every street artist does. You look at the canvas presented to you and we look at cities in a whole other way. Like, like I go to a new city and I'm looking at things that people are looking at this landmark and I'm looking at this awesome old dilapidated building that I'm like, I'm hitting that tomorrow morning. <laughs> so, so we look at it in a totally different way. And all I'm saying is I looked at those utility boxes and kind of said, I think they could be beautified. So, and now, know. and now, yes, I have, I have a bunch of like in LA, I have a bunch of street, uh, uh, utility boxes that have been given to me by the city by those there's like three different well, organizations yeah all right cool cool hear that cleveland all right so you've been all over the world now tell tell us about kind of your path in taking wordsmith beyond la and beyond the united states and you know was that just yeah. uh an add-on to your travels or is that what what drove your travels Tell us about that. Um, it was it was both because I love to travel. Period. Um, and and I miss it so much um, this last year. But uh, when I started wordsmithing, because the beautiful thing about a street artist is we are so mobile. You have to work quickly. You know what I mean. And 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 again, I kind of kind of said I found a way around that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like just pretending you're supposed to be there. But the impetus of street art is that's why stencils were created because you needed to. You had an image in your mind, but you needed to paint it quickly. You know what I mean? Before you got caught. So that's how stencils um, originated. Um, and and because of that, my art is and always has been mobile. So when I went anywhere, because I love to travel. I took the art with me. Um, I was lucky because I had family in London. Um, so I started early on coming to London and taking my art and going over to Paris by train and, and doing art. And it's funny because I think every art, every street artist that starts, I think the rest of the street art community is kind of like, okay, who is this? What are they doing? How long are they gonna last? And I know that happened with me. You know what I mean? There was the typewriter guy that was popping up all over Los Angeles. And, and I could tell a story about the, 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 I'll come back to talk about the street art community. But I think a lot of artists kind of looked at me like, who is this? How long are they going to last? But when I kind of really quickly started going to London and, and putting up pieces in Paris, I think a lot of people were like, oh shit, this kid means business. You know what I mean? Like, and it was a good feeling and it was part of my growth. You know what I mean? That it wasn't- Was that all wasn't. underground too, Brody? Was that? That all, was that all underground too? Was that all uh, non-permission? Oh yeah, I, there was, there was, it was no permission for, for even though like there was a wall here or there, yeah. like, like that kind of was given by people that had it. Like I said, that first wall that I did, I think the first three years at least were just, just all renegade. And, and people ask me that all the time. They go, how much of your work is renegade? And I always say today, I always say 50% because I'm a street artist. So if I'm sent anywhere, like in 2018, I was sent to Auckland to do 10 pieces in, in a rugby stadium. Um, and it was an incredible experience. Like I'm, I'm doing pieces in, in New Zealand in this stadium. And I thought that was great. But at night I would walk around and eat dinner and I would I like to go dinner and bars and I would see these walls and I'd be like, I'm going to hit that. I'm going to hit that. So in my week that I was, or I think I was there six or seven days, I did 10 renegade pieces around the city. So it's, it's always going to be 50%. You know what I mean? You send the street artists anywhere, they're going to do what they do. Um, and it'll always be 50% because I, even though I, I am lucky that I get to do this as a living and I am given walls and I am commissioned, I love giving art to the people. And that's another thing that street art is. It's literally putting a gallery out there on the streets. And, and that was a big part of my story. Like people love turning the corner and unexpectedly seeing these pieces. And that's why it can be any size. I mean, now I do you know, sides of buildings and huge murals, but I still carry the little stencils that make a piece about this big, you know what I mean? 
uh, because because it's going. it's it's putting it somewhere that that people yeah. someone's going to discover it and there's some beauty in that it, it can be, be even more impactful than doing the side of a building if you just tuck away yeah, like a little a little thought you know what I mean to somebody that yeah. that turns a I corner. love those little ones that you have you know, somebody yeah. uh, just asked uh, Brody how do you tailor your work to each city so uh, what what about the city might inspire you that's that's an awesome question. Um, I, I take I, I mean, my work and my words um, are, are I, I want to say universal or any city like the majority of it like I realized that when I first started I thought I was just talking to Los Angeles, but I was doing pieces like dream bigger and aspire to insp aspire to inspire others and the universe will take note. But then I realized really early on because of that butterfly effect that it wasn't just about Los Angeles. People everywhere have these aspirations and dreams. And, and I always say there's like Dennis in the Carolinas that want to you know, be an actor and there's stockbrokers in Chicago that want to write a book. So I just realized it was, it was everywhere. So I can take my work to any city and it'll resonate. However, I research, I've researched cities before I've got there and, and see what's going on at the time or, or what the language is and are there any buzzwords or this or that. And I write specifically to the city. A good example is that and it's not about buzzwords is the first time I went to New Orleans, they were still recovering from Katrina. I think they still are. Um, in some in some ways, and there were so many walls, and there were so many dilapidated, unfortunately dilapidated buildings, and and I did all these words, but I had friends that lived there, so I knew the situation. So I kind of catered those words to New Orleans and the rebuilding and just the staying positive, and it had a huge effect. I mean, I have a really great following, but I think it's because of those early years when I was just just showing up and and just 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 making my mark in a town and, and talking to them specifically. So any city I go to, I try to have some specific words that, that cool. mean something to the city. Cool. Um, and, soon, and I like doing that. And soon uh, we'll talk about your mark that you're going to make in Cleveland and uh, yes. kind of bring it back full circle. One more question on the city. So um, uh, is it always in English language or do you ever do any of your pieces in the language of the countries that you're in? It's a great question. Uh, I, I mainly do English. Uh, when I first was like going to Paris, I did some in French. And it's so funny. Uh, now I know like like the French are just I, I love I love the French. I'm not picking on them, but they're so picky that I, I literally went to a couple that grew up, lived in France their entire life. And I said, here what I want to say. And they wrote it out. And then I, when I posted it on my feed, I got all this, oh no, we don't say it that way. And you don't put this much. And I just realized like yeah. anything, like you go to New York and there's these different dialects and stuff yeah. like yeah. that. So I kind of, even though I still like doing other languages, I realized that most countries really embrace English and especially it's like romantic, you know what I mean? Of, a, of English words and stuff like that. So I, I lean on that and pretty much do what I do. Having said that, like I want to go to I want to go to China and Japan and just do pieces in their beautiful language and and just like you know just do stuff like that. But I'll always make sure it's translated. I just hope I don't have that same kind of critique that I've had in some countries. So when did people find out it was you? How did that all come about? Um, it it really officially happened in 2017 because around my first ever solo show, which was in Los Angeles, but to be candid, like it was even two years before that. So I think like maybe three or four years in because of what I said, like with me doing my job, like, like I believe I started believing in what I do and I do believe in what I do far too much to conceal my identity. So I kind of, just let it go and just said, I am wordsmith. Like if you, if you, at that time, if you met me in a gallery, I'd be like, yeah, I'm this artist. And I loved talking and interacting with people who's, who my work was resonating with. You know, that was the impetus of just kind of like saying, I, I want these people, not that, not, I want them to know it's me, but I want to talk to them and I want to hear their experiences. So I kind of was letting up the, or letting go of the anonymity earlier Probably than when I'm out on that right because there's a there's a pro and a con to being anonymous but you know first yeah being able to... I mean I think everybody starts it because of the legality yeah but then 
but then there is this kind of not cool factor, but it, but it's just like like Banksy hides his identity, so I should also and 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 I love that artist. I love that guy. You know what I mean? But but he has I a thing. Was, I thought it was a chick. <laughs> it might be. It might be a group of people. There's a lot of theories. Right. But uh, but but I don't know. So that's where it starts. But but again, it just made more sense to me to just kind of like let it go because. I hated like like I pay it forward a lot, so I would show up to these charity events and yeah. still like cover my face, and I'm like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that person. I want to I want to be. I was proud, you know, of what I was doing, and and I don't know. I, it was just it, it just it just made sense for me at the time. And then right before my solo show, the reason I, I cite that is that's when in interviews and and documentaries, I just stopped hiding my face. Like I used to do the hat and ducking the. The head, the head down or shadowed face. And, and I was like, I don't know, I, I want people I want. And, I, and, and that's another thing. Like, like I said, I love interacting with my audience because I know the words are affecting them. So any message you send to me or my website or, or my Instagram, I control it. And I see all the messages and I love taking the time when I have the time to, to reach out and, and answer those questions and just talk to people. Um, and also young artists, like I, I will open up my studio to anybody and say, or just even, even, even my brain and say, here's how you can do it. And here's how you can accomplish it. And here's what I know about stenciling. Cause, cause I just, I, again, I never expected to make a dime. I never expected to be here today. It's such a thrill and, and being the positive artist that I am or street artist that I am, I'd be, I'd be, a, I'd be so contradictory of everything if I didn't do that. And that's just who I am. So, so I love talking to people and I love helping people and I love paying it forward. And, and that's also this, this is the charity that you're doing with the scholarship funds. And I think it's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, you know, this world needs more positivity and it's just, um, it's wonderful. Uh, what you do, Brody, and uh, the, the wordsmith pieces that that resonate with so many people. Um, and we're really looking forward to seeing what you have coming uh, at the next at the next uh, chapter here in 2021. Um, we we want to hear a little bit about what's on your plate in 2021. Rumor has it that uh, you're, you're going to make your way to Cleveland uh, with Graffiti Heart in the uh, How Do I Love Thee Tour coming near us in August. So, Absolutely. Uh, let's, let's talk about that. We're, we are stoked. Uh, we yes. can't wait to have you here, not for one, but for a series of, of uh, uh, multiple pieces throughout our city and schools and hopefully libraries and other organizations that we can uh, really continue to use your, your, your art and your words to help bring positivity to the city. Absolutely. And just to back up a little bit, like it's been such a priority for me for the last couple of years to come to Cleveland. Again, I was born and raised there and I wanted to come back and make my mark. And it just kept kind of getting on the back burner. And I know if the pandemic didn't happen, it would have happened already. However, during that time, a mutual friend of ours, Michelle, she's so awesome, put us in contact. And I was so thankful for that because now it's happening on a grand scale and an organized scale. And, and, and the reason I'm saying that is when I do come to Cleveland, hopefully we put it on the calendar for, for early August and yeah. fingers are crossed that, that everything with what's good, the craziness that's going on in the world, that that can still happen. But whenever it happens, I'm going to come and make my mark in that city. And I'm so excited to do that. Um, I can't wait. So I hope it's August. But if not, whenever it happens, it's going to be epic. I'm repping Cleveland. I hope everybody yeah. sees that. Huge, CLG. like I said, yeah, CLG. huge. Yes, yes, Michelle and uh, friends, we are going to have a big party. And we'll have. Oh, my God, it's going to be epic. Many, many, many parties, and uh, we will celebrate for sure. So hopefully by uh, the second week of August, um, things will be in a place where we can at least um, get you here in Cleveland, in the States, and uh, be able to. Uh, paint the town and you know the good thing is is that you know as long as we can get you here we can make it happen because it'll be a, a really nice warm time of the year here in Cleveland and uh, that's really when when our uh, public murals have really uh, accelerated this past year with the pandemic you know we all went and shut down and then uh, once we kind of woke up and figured hey you know the weather's starting to break let, let's just paint the town so uh, 2021 yeah. for you know, Wordsmith uh, coming to Cleveland is is 
going to be great. So fingers crossed. I'm going I'm to take that springboard and plug one of the items that are on the auction. Yes. I have a couple like cans, paint cans. But one of the things we talked about was when I do come to Cleveland, uh, we, we have a mural, a personal mural, whether it's your home, your business, your bar, whatever, I will come, I will work with you. I'll show you a couple options for words, but I will come to your place and paint that um, typewriter and page and those inspirational words. And so it's there on the, on the, on the auction site and it's live right now for how much longer? A couple of days. Till 10 o'clock. Cool. Oh, so well, bid away on that. And whenever. About uh, two more hours. Yeah. So, and again, that happens whenever I am in Cleveland, whether it's August or whenever it happens, I'm coming to paint whoever bids on that, um, mm -hmm. it, it, wherever they want it. It could be patio, it could be living room, it could be on your house. I've done houses, so so it could be fun. And hopefully there's going to be a bid war out there, right? You know that there's already a bid on it, so hopefully there'll be other people uh, trying to get that as well. That's what I'm trying to say. It's such a great cause, so hopefully, hopefully... Hopefully it'll, it'll go well. Yeah, for sure. So anybody uh, on, we've got a few minutes left. If anybody has questions for Wordsmith, uh, we'd love to get you to be able to get your questions asked. I know somebody had asked uh, if you had any uh, stories where you were busted. From yeah, I had a couple of close encounters, but, but never, never arrested. I've been very lucky. Um, I think it's, uh, I think it's because, um, I like to say it's because I'm lucky and I'm, I'm nimble, like I'm a ninja. So, so even though I'm doing pieces during the day, I'm doing them smart and I look like I'm supposed to be there. Uh, somebody wants to know what you're drinking, Brody. Uh, drinking some red wine, some Pinot Noir. Um, it's, it's, it's midnight. It's almost one here in, in London. I'm in London right now. I have family here, so it's, it's late. So I'm enjoying some some red wine well um what about uh talk to us about your pup oh i have a dog it's he's awesome i uh, uh when was it early 2018 i rescued a, a german shepherd puppy it was a litter of five three girls two boys but he was um born with one ear and and, and it, he only has one ear, but there's no ear canal. It's all skin and fur and there's no side effects. He's just super special. Um, but his name is Vincent Van Gogh. Um, and I call him Vincent. It's just his full name's Vincent Van Gogh. Um, and he's just an awesome dog. He came the journey with me. He's here in London with me now and very, very happy. The trooper. Yeah. yeah. Interesting question for you, Wordsmith. Uh, any dream collaboration ideas? Yeah, I, 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 I thought about that. Somebody asked me that in a prior interview and, and I love doing collaborations, but I love doing them when it's truly two artists combining and I, like to make an awesome idea. Like I see a lot of collaborations and it's like, you put your piece here, I'll put my piece here. And I love kind of combining them together and I've done some great collaborations. But if you're asking me about a dream collaboration, I, I want to talk to Banksy about putting a piece on the moon that we can see every night. Awesome. <laughs> That's, I mean, you gotta, you gotta literally like, like, like shoot for the stars if you're talking dreams. <laughs> so that would be it. Or well, Shepard. Shepard so could, probably, could probably pull it off. There you go. He probably could. Maybe he already has. Yeah. That so would be, like, that would be the dream. Be, you might be able to do that. Everything you, you've, uh, aim for you've been able to accomplish right so Pretty uh, much. what's your favorite project one of your favorite projects that you've done um favorite projects um i i i, I always talk about uh, one of my favorite walls was um i i did work for powwow if, if it's an organization that started in hawaii and they do cities across um the world um, but I did Pawa Worcester, which is outside of Boston. And I did this awesome piece that I had been wanting to do on the side of a building, which was a library. And it's basically my font in an alphabet. Um, and it was, it was like, it was like four, I was, I, how, I forgot how tall it was. Um, I think like 65 feet tall, I forgot. Or, or, but it was just, it was a four story building. And the word at the bottom of it, which was a six foot piece was, this is my palette. It's a mere 26 deep, but the possibilities are endless. 
And I love that piece. I want to bring it to Cleveland too in another yeah. form. But to me, that's everything that's wordsmith in a nutshell. It's just like this, my palette is, is, is colors, sure, but it's the alphabet and, and writing just fascinates me from when I was nine years old to today. And, and I think the possibilities are absolutely endless. So um, you're a writer. You have, do you have or have you thought about, um, are you planning on putting a book together with your pieces? Yeah, um, I definitely want to do a coffee table book and I'm coming up soon on 10 years. And I think that that might be the benchmark because it has been such a idea and an undertaking and what I want it to be. I think I might do it at the 10 year mark and it'll be pretty epic when I do do it. Um, um, and I have a lot of creative ideas to make it fun, um, but it's definitely going to be an undertaking. So, so yes, it's going to happen um, and it's going to be epic. And uh, I'm thinking 10 years, which would be pretty much, um, when would that be the end of not, it would be the end of 2022 would be my 10 year mark. Great. It'll take me that long to put it together, but that's how books happen. So we got your, uh, you have a calendar calendar published this year too. That was yes. some excuses. So uh, we have that here at the gallery. So hopefully we'll see uh, another can calendar for 2022, perhaps. See any Definitely. Other out there? Let's see. We got one else coming out here. Ah, okay. It sounds like we may have hit them all. Uh, da -da -da -da. Any uh, any last words that you want to give to? No. Other than I'm so thrilled to be doing this, to have met you, and then to the the prospect of coming to Cleveland and just I would have come on my own and made my mark, renegade or or beg for walls, but 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 doing it this way and and what we're talking about and aiming for is just going to be so fantastic. I can't wait, but I can't tell you how dear. Cleveland is to my heart and how much I've wanted to come and and just wordsmith just paint the town so I'm very very excited well we're very excited I'm really honored to be able to um, meet you and become friends Brody and uh, thanks to Michelle Tamalo and uh, to <sighs> hook us up over the last couple of years she, she's been wanting you here probably more than you in the last few years and we're finally able to make this happen uh, pending pending the uh, situation but we're planning on it second week of August uh, so we've got uh, a lot of planning to happen ahead of us. Um, really stoked to, just to Love have it. you here and have some fun together with uh, everybody else in the community to join in. And really appreciate your time tonight. I know it's late there in London. Oh, it was it was uh, my pleasure, and and I'll stay up late for you anytime. Appreciate it. So until next time, Phil. All right. Word Take Smith, care, everybody. 2021. Take care. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Have a good night. Bye bye.